the Leviathan Chronicles. Season 2. The story thus far. Harlequin has escaped to Leviathan and miraculously survived the ascent from 36,000 feet underwater to find himself floating in the South Pacific. After enduring days of exposure in the open ocean, Harlequin is rescued by his former ward, Lisette Mansabile, who has stolen the famed aircraft, the Condor. Back in Leviathan, after blackmailing the leading politicians, McAllen has now been named Special Council Chair of Leviathan City and is trying to orchestrate a strike force to find the Seraxian aliens on the surface, while also trying to keep the conditions within Leviathan from deteriorating further. And now, Chapter 28, Unforgivable Sin. The Philippine Sea. <sighs> <sighs> Queen, give me your hand! Uh, here! Here! Come over to the wing! Come on! Give me your hand! Give me your... Lisette reached into the ocean and stretched to grab Harlequin's hand, which he struggled to raise higher than his shoulder. Pull, she yes? snatched his hand and heaved Ready? him upwards out of the water and onto the slender wings on the condor which rested on the surface of the South Pacific. Harlequin lay limply with his face pressed against the cold tritanium of the wing. Lisette merely stood and stared at him. Harlequin! Harlequin, get up! Harlequin? What is it? What's wrong? Harlequin slowly brought his knees underneath him and awkwardly rose to his unsteady feet. He squinted from the harsh Pacific sun that continued to ravage his sunburnt, blistered face. Lisette could now finally take full measure of the man that had once been her mentor, and she recoiled at his condition. Zut alors! Your face! She stared at Harlequin, whose face was badly mangled with contusions and purple bruises from his fight with Banu. Blisters from the unrelenting sun exposure dotted the back of his neck. The skin in his hands and face were grotesquely wrinkled and shone bright red. He stood unevenly, favoring his right leg, although Lisette thought it might just be from the strange, cumbersome exposure suit he was wearing. His eyes looked weary, solemn, and defeated. She had never in her life seen him look worse. Sherry, what happened to you? Who did this to you? Ah! Harlequin lunged forward and roughly rushed past Lisette, almost knocking her into the ocean. He stumbled ineptly towards the hatch to the condor and moved urgently inside. Hey! What the hell is your problem, Harlequin? Hey! I'm talking to you, Harlequin! Once he entered the cabin, he tore off the exposure suit, which was now disgustingly pungent with urine and waste. Harlequin dropped to his hands and knees and ripped off the seat cushions in the cargo hold and tore through the storage bins underneath. Harlequin! Oh, it smells disgusting in here. Harlequin now resembled a feral animal tearing through the contents of the cargo hold until finally he found what he was searching for, a bottle of spring water. His hands shook as they frantically twisted off the plastic top. He brought the bottle to his lips, getting as much as he could inside his mouth, letting the cool water wash over his face until... Harlequin violently threw the bottle of water against the wall, nearly hitting Lizette. What? What is wrong with you? I... I don't understand. Why won't you... Harlequin lunged for the bottle on the floor. What? What the hell? Why are you acting like Half this? Half a litre of water disappeared into Harlequin's mouth, with streams running down the side of his mouth and chest. He quickly drained the bottle before letting it drop to the floor. There was a pain in Harlequin's mouth like he had never thought possible. Less than 24 hours earlier, Banu had taken a glowing hot blowtorch and pressed it against the sensitive skin of his tongue, burning the skin to a crisp. He was desperately dehydrated, but the very act of ingesting water caused him such massive pain that he could barely keep his mouth closed. He collapsed to the floor of the cargo hold and wept. In his stupor, Harlequin looked up to see Lisette, his young protégé, standing defensively against the far bulkhead, pointing a Beretta PX4 9mm pistol directly at him. What the hell is going on with you? Why won't you talk to me? I did what we agreed. I located the condor and stole it from where you left it near Nankatsu. I flew it to your location and now you're acting fucking crazy. Either you tell me what the hell is wrong with you, or I shoot first and fucking fly myself back to Paris. 
Harlequin remained on the floor, sobbing into his hands. He was so young, just a tiny child. Did I corrupt your savior? I'm so tired of this weight of sin. Please, Father, remember me. Harlequin! He reached for the internal railing and pulled himself up to stare at Lizette. He raised his left hand up as if to stop her, and then lurched past Lizette to get to the computer console outside the cockpit. He started typing furiously into the keyboard. I am damaged. I... I don't understand. Why won't you just talk to me? Why are you... Harlequin exploded and slammed Lisette against the wall. She dropped the Beretta and Harlequin shoved his hand over her mouth. He pressed his face against hers and cried desperately. Lisette didn't know whether to comfort him or push him away. He slowly pulled back, holding her hands at her side and opened his mouth, showing Lisette his burnt, damaged God. tongue. Won't you, Harlequin? What did they do to you? Harlequin buried his head into Lizette's tiny shoulders and sobbed uncontrollably. There! It's okay now! It's okay! You are safe, mon chéri! It's okay! Tell me what happened! He pulled back and returned to the keyboard. I returned to Leviathan. Old enemies there. The city is under siege. Barely escaped. Well, I'm sorry, but I've got some bad news. I managed to steal this crazy plane for you, but I hope you can still swim, because we're not going anywhere. I almost ran completely out of fuel getting here, and I'm pretty sure that we're resting on empty right now. We're stuck, Harlequin. Harlequin allowed himself the faintest outline of a smile and turned to walk to the cockpit of the Condor. He sat down in the co-pilot's chair and flipped several switches, taking the vessel into hydrostrom mode. The Condor shuddered and began to sink into the surface of the ocean as the protective shield slid over the recessed cockpit. Lizette stood behind him as he strained to reach under the computer console and with some difficulty removed a small hockey puck device that was affixed underneath. What the hell did you just do? Instantly, the fuel gauge on the Condor jumped to read almost a quarter full. What was that thing? The fuel gauge was reading close to empty. Harlequin returned to the keyboard. Insurance policy allowed you to fly the most advanced aircraft on the planet. Needed you to bypass biometric code. The vaccine accurately stated the fuel reserves in order to create a sense of urgency to the other immortals. We have enough fuel to make it to our next round. And where is that? Where are we going? Sanctuary. Leviathan City, days later. A lone pushpod whispered across Leviathan's vast cavern ceiling, thousands of feet above the streets below. It departed from Dickerson Terminal near Leviathan Cathedral and traversed the width of the Great Cavern to finish its journey near a series of residential units built midway up the cavern wall. The pod's lone occupant exited the sky tube and walked slowly to the unit that she had called home for the last several weeks. McKellen, you're back. Any word? I just came from the Med Tower. Oh, there's been no change in Evangeline's condition. Well, at least her condition isn't deteriorating. And I suppose that's good news. No. No, you don't get it. It's, it's not good news, Anton. The longer a patient stays in a coma, the less likely they are to come out of it. We're running out of time, Anton. McAllen and Anton both exchanged long stares at each other before Anton held out his hand. You have had a seriously long day. In addition to looking after Evangeline, you're now the special Leviathan Council co-chair. Well, along with Mayor Center. Still, and quite a rise to political power. Terrific. If only Provost Reiner could see me now. Oh, Betty always thought you had bright prospects. <laughs> I seriously doubt that. And let's not be too modest. I certainly couldn't have negotiated that snake pit you call the council without the assistance of my senior executive aide. After all, it was your idea to get Maestro Vibrucci and Lorelei involved. Without them, I never would have had the leverage to control the committee, and without you, I wouldn't even be alive. Thank you, Anton. Thank you for everything. No thanks required, McCallan. I never cared much for Bennu, but I never imagined he'd betray Evangeline like that. On the other hand, I never believed I'd lay eyes on two Seraxian aliens within Leviathan. What were they doing here, Anton? Why would Evangeline keep them prisoner? Why would she keep them such a secret? Maybe she saw them as some sort of threat. If they were a threat, why didn't she tell anyone? Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Sadly, Evangeline can't tell us anything now. But what about military Prime Officer Khan? 
Is he going to approve your strike force mission to find the alien? He said he'd let me know in the next 24 hours. At the very least, he acquiesced to recalling all citizens on the surface back to Leviathan. Well, he drew the line at the Darkwater agents. Not surprising. Could be hard to extract them from undercover positions. Still, you've accomplished a lot in a short period of time. I think all I've done is keep the council focused on hating me instead of bickering with each other. Whatever keeps the wheels of motion turning. No, they're not turning fast enough. Chief Engineer Denson reported power outages in the Lanier Street residences, and the West Bay hangar was shut down for two hours earlier today. At least most of the Zephyrs were already out to sea, gathering citizens on leave. Still, the situation is getting worse, Anton. We have to find a way to stop this virus in the AI. I still can't believe that a little piece of code can bring down a centuries-old city in a matter of weeks. It's more than just a piece of code, Anton. Yesterday, Astrid Ansler, the underchief engineer, pulled me aside and said that their initial calculations might have been off and that we might have less time than we thought. She said we could lose all non-essential power in the city in as little as four days. Once that happens, the situation will spiral out of control, leading to the loss of integrity of the pressure shield. It's a huge risk calling everyone back to Leviathan. This place could become a mass tomb. Well, Evangeline would have done it. The more people we have to assign to the task force, the better our chances of saving Leviathan are. The people we bring back could hold the answer to- I agree, but if they can't- If they can't, then Leviathan would be destroyed anyway, and the citizens would be left on the surface with no access to a star stone and die in a decade or two anyway. At least by having everyone here trying to find a solution, they die fighting for something they believe in. That's quite a choice to be making for them, McKellen. You're right, it is quite a choice. Do you think it's the wrong one? No. No, I don't. Your decision speaks of courage. I think you've made the right call, despite it being a risky one. It will inspire those to do their best. Thank you, Anton. You're welcome, McAllen. And speaking of courage, I think I could use a drink. <laughs> Me too. McAllen stood and walked over to the polished Wenge cabinet that sat at the far end of the room and picked up two heavy lead crystal glasses. Come over here. What's over there? This. McAllen held up a dark green bottle adorned with a black ribbon and a scrimshaw tag. Is that McAllister's Venotius? By the goddess, that's rare stuff. I haven't had a sip in ages. Where did you get it? A small present from Angus McKay. He told me that if I was going to be filling Evangeline's shoes, I might be needing a bottle of this. More like a case. My god, that looks beautiful. McCallum poured the glistening honey-like liquid into the crystal glasses and handed one to Anton. They each brought the glasses to their nose before sipping. Mm -hmm. Oh, and tastes even better. I figure after being in exile for 70 years, you deserve some of the good stuff. Mm, that I do. McAllen turned and walked slowly towards the large window of her apartment that looked down 600 feet below the city beneath her. Her unit overlooked most of the northern section of Leviathan, including the terracotta rooftops of the old city quarter, the large multi-level teepee that housed the Earth Sciences Division. And off to the side, McAllen could just catch a glimpse of the Emerald Courtyard beside the cathedral where Evangeline had confided so much in McAllen. She let her forehead rest against the cool glass and took another long sip of the notion. Anton, what's that sand crawler picking up there? The one beside Abel Park? I think that's one of our flagpoles. A long row of them was knocked down when Harlequin made his dramatic escape down Tweedle Boulevard. We're still cleaning up some of the wreckage. McAllen squinted her eyes and could just make out the tattered remains of the Leviathan flag, two sea dragons on either side of a sunburst at the end of the long ivory pole. We need to get them back up as soon as possible. People need to see the Leviathan flag flying again, full mast. Send a message to Pedro Santana, the creative underchief. Tell him to make it a priority that people see that Leviathan is recovering. He'll understand. I'll speak to him first thing. <sighs> what do you think happened to him? To Pedro? Uh, no, um... No, no to Harlequin. The Leviathan Defense Unit reported that a sand crawler was destroyed while making a run for the main trench. Did they retrieve the body? McAllen, with 36,000 feet underwater, his body could fit in a suit can if there was any left of it. I wonder... Are you alright? What? Yeah! <laughs> yeah, I'm fine, Anton. I just got lost in my thoughts for a moment. I'm an excellent listener. I bet you are. Seriously. Tell me what's troubling you. McAllen tilted her head and stared at Anton. Imminent death? <laughs> okay. Well, look, tell me what else is bothering you. Ah, it's stupid. It's part of the past. Well, you know you can always... <sighs> it's just... Oh, fucking Tully! I just... Oh, just can't believe that utter loser left me while I was about to be killed by Bennu. I mean, how? How can he do that? We were... Friends! Friends? Well, apparently not. Friends don't let other friends die at the hands of maniacs. Look, I certainly can't make excuses for the man. 
And the only thing I can honestly say is that he came to my hospital bed to talk about you. As soon as Evangeline sounded the security alert, we were both coming to find you. He got to you a little faster than I did. Maybe he jumped through the keyhole because he knew I was a few seconds behind. Well, I might not have had a few seconds. McCallum rubbed her neck that still showed bruises from Banu's attack. Anton walked closer to her to stand beside the window as well. Look, as I said, I... I can't really defend him, but... I told you that I would never leave you. I made that promise to Senshin. So you're only here because of Senshin? No. No. I, I'm here for my own reasons, McCallan. Tell me your reasons, Anton. Jesus, what now? Who is it? Honor guard, ma'am. Please, open the door. McCallan shot a concerned look at Anton, who nodded to open the door. Instead of one, three honor guards stood in McCallan's doorway. Yes, what is it? I'm sorry to disturb you, Council Chair, but I have orders from Prime Minister Khan. We're here to take Anton into custody. What? Like hell you are? Get Mayor Sinter over here now. Mayor and... Sinter co-signed the order, ma'am. Under what basis? Treason. Anton and his brethren killed a lot of people when they rebelled 70 years ago. Anton is a criminal here in Leviathan. No! That, that was 70 years ago. He saved my life. You can't just... McCallan. McCallan, it's okay. I'll go with them. I don't want to start any trouble that will undermine your authority. Leviathan has had enough conflict for one day. Let's not make it any no, worse. No, no, Anton! I need you! You can't... It'll be all right. You need to talk to Lorelei. Do it quickly. She'll know what to do. Anton! The two larger guards moved to flank either side of Anton, and before McCallan could say another word, the four of them exited through the doorway, leaving McCallan suddenly alone. Please, Dr. Pisker. The answer is no, Rebecca. I don't feel comfortable increasing your dosage given that you already have a prescription for Xanax and Adderall. I just need to get some rest. Have you considered increasing your exercise regimen? So Doctor, that... I'm a 32-year-old single woman living in New York. I have gym memberships at Crunch, Equinox, and Reebok. I do three Zumba classes a week and Bikram Yoga four times a week. I barely have enough time to water the plants in my own apartment, and I just realized that I own more clothes from Nike than from Ann Taylor. I'm here because I have problems. Deep problems, but getting to the gym isn't one of them. Okay, point taken, Rebecca. But if you can't get to sleep... No, no, doctor. You don't get it. I can get to sleep. That's not the problem. I just... I just don't want to go to the awful places my mind is taking me. I'm not sure that it's I... It's the dreams, doctor. You've got to give me something so that I don't dream anymore. Something... Anything that Dreaming just... is an important part of the sleep cycle, Rebecca. It's when your mind integrates the memories that are formed throughout your waking day and allows your body to repair and recharge the... Doctor, I'm not going to have a body if these nightmares don't stop. I'm asking you for help. Rebecca, look, I could offer you some Seroquel. It's an antipsychotic medicine that many patients report helps them sleep. But I'm only going to give this to you if you check in with my receptionist every 48 hours for the next two weeks. This is very strong stuff, Rebecca. It can have serious side effects. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I really hope this helps. The nightmares are really getting worse. Let's talk about that more. What is it exactly that you're trying to escape so badly? Is it this... this demon that you've mentioned? No, it's become more than that. I don't understand. It's not the demon. I mean... It is, but the dream has changed. It's totally different now. Uh, before you said you'd been having the same dream every night for months, you allowed for some small thematic variation, but you're telling me that you're having an entirely different dream now? Yes. Well, I think that's quite a breakthrough, Rebecca. No, you don't understand. It's worse. This new dream is torturing me worse than the first. Where does this new dream start? The dream always starts in the middle. I'm running through a maze. A horrible, twisted, disgusting maze. The walls around me are decrepit metal and covered in mucus and rust. I'm not alone. There's a terrible presence in the maze as well. It's chasing me. And I can feel time is running out. My throat keeps getting tighter. And sometimes when I go around corners, the ceiling starts to get lower. I keep scraping my head and face against the walls. It makes it hard to run, but I know I have to keep moving faster. There's there's no time, and I just... I just want to get out of the maze. 
I want to escape so badly. And I can hear sounds. Horrible, awful sounds of what's going on behind the metal walls. People are being hurt. They're dying so slowly. Then, when I go deeper into the maze, I find myself at these dead ends. And that's where I can see him there, waiting and looking right at me. The demon? No, no. It's a boy, a little boy, alone. He's not moving, but he's watching me. He won't move, and, and we both know the demon is coming. He's so close. What does the boy do? Nothing. He's just standing there in the maze. I run to the little boy, and I'm trying to talk to him. He won't move or speak. What's your name? And he won't leave. I want to save him because I know he's scared too, but he's been in the maze longer than I have. Come on! I pull on his arm, but he won't go. We have to go! We both know the demon is getting closer. And then the boy turns to me and says, You have to run away. But there's nowhere to run. The presence keeps getting closer and the ground beneath us starts shaking. The maze keeps getting hotter. And I can... Taste the vomit starting to rise in my throat. I leave the boy and start running the other way down the corridor. The fucking maze keeps twisting again. And the walls keep moving in front of me like everything around me here is alive. Before I know it, I'm running down another dead end. And the little boy is there again. He's always at the end, waiting for me. What are you doing here? I try to make him leave with me again. The boy starts shaking. And he puts both of his hands to my face and pulls me in close and whispers in my ear, Go on to kill you. I think we should end our session here, Rebecca. <laughs> Meanwhile, 40,000 feet above sea level, a Bombardier Challenger 300 executive jet raced through the skies of South China. Tolly, you've got to check out these bathrooms. The toilet is amazing. It has this little remote control that shoots Old water boy. up your- sit down. We gotta talk. I just thought of something. What's that? McAllen and your friend Mai Lee. They could be in a lot of trouble. What do you mean? Well, I don't even know if McAllen is still alive. And, and if she is, she's never gonna wanna speak to me again, but but assuming Anton was able to save her then, Leviathan City may not be around much longer. You see, the whole city is governed by some sort of computer system that keeps all the water from coming in. That scumbag, Banu, planted a virus inside that could destroy the city by killing all the power that supports the pressure shield. How much time do you think they have? I don't know, but you know how we're trying to figure out a way to get back to Leviathan? I've been researching that. There are two deep sea expeditions headed to the bottom of the Mariana Trench in the near future. How well do you know Sir Richard Branson? Won't return my calls. Oh. Well, how about James Cameron? Oberlin, no one is going to let us tag along on a multi-million dollar expedition to save our girlfriends in a make-believe city under the ocean. We need to find another keyhole that will give us a portal back to Leviathan. You said that you heard most of the keyholes were shut down. That's just it. If we're struggling to find a way in, maybe they are struggling to find a way out. Oberlin stared at Tully. How much time do you think they have? I told you, I don't know, but they Captain can't. Captain Tully. Agent Harris? It's time we had a word. Um, I'm going to go look out the window. We're going to be landing in a few hours. Where are we landing? Military base on Okinawa. Are we stopping for some sushi? Because if we are, We're I... switching planes. What's wrong with this plane? It doesn't have the fuel range to get us to Alaska. That's where you're from, right? Alaska. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's where I'm from. Good. So, Captain Tully, it looks to me like I'm holding up my end of the bargain. You've got your plane ride home. And I think it's time for you to start telling me what you know about the extraterrestrials and Whit Roberts. Look, I can only tell you what I heard. Right after you and your boys unloaded that first round of gunfire, Whit Roberts got really agitated. He looked like he saw a ghost or something. Anyway, he ran over to this, this briefcase he had and started talking into the receiver to a guy named Sterling. Celeste froze when she heard the name. You're sure that's the name you heard? Sterling. Jason Sterling. Yeah, I think so. Jason Sterling. I've heard that name before. That's the guy who Anton wants to kill. Who's Anton? A friend of mine who's an asshole. Who is this Jason Sterling? Celeste Harris sat back in the leather command chair. 
and coolly evaluated Jeffrey Tully. Jason Sterling is a former member of Black Door who has gone rogue and is believed to be working with the extraterrestrials. He's responsible for the murder of scores of Black Door agents, and he's more dangerous than any terrorist on Earth. He and Whit Roberts are in league together, so it's very, very important that you tell me where they are, Captain Tully. Well, I don't know exactly where Whit Roberts is this very second, but when Whit Roberts told Sterling about that word you said, door lock, this guy Sterling got pretty worked up about it. He sounded pretty scared. Get to the point, Captain. Where is Whit Roberts? Look, like I said, I obviously don't know where he is right now, but Sterling said to him that they had to rendezvous soon. He sounded like he was running out of time or something. Where? What place did he say? Where is the rendezvous point? Um, I'm trying to remember. The station. He said they had to meet at the station. That doesn't exactly help us, Captain Tully. The station? What is it? A train station? A power station? A goddamn space station? If you can't... New New York. Jason Sterling is headed to New York City. That's where the station is. And he's going to meet Whit Roberts there. listening to the Leviathan Chronicles. The Leviathan Chronicles was written and created by Christoph Lepupka, produced by Robin Shaw, produced and musical composition by Luke Allen, directed by Nobi Nakanishi. For a full list of cast and crew, or to purchase the ad-free director's cut, go to leviathanchronicles.com. Thank you for supporting us, and thank you for listening. To discover more podcasts set in the Leviathan universe, go to leviathanaudioproductions.com or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Leviathan Audio Production.